Hello and welcome to episode 142 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. This week we have for you climate misinformation that has exploded on Twitter since the takeover of you-know-who. Well, Elon Musk said it is to blame on Hunter Biden's laptop. France has finalized their ban on short-haul flights and will also limit private jet travel. Plans to launch a Patreon for the Clean Energy Show Private Jet Fund have been put on hold. A Texas foundation is doing everything it can to fight renewables in the name of fossil fuels. And as Brian said last week, everything is bigger in Texas, even the lies. A $21 billion project will link the UK to a solar and wind farm in the Sahara Desert. The project has been delayed as they search for a 2300 mile extension cord. All that and a plethora more on this week's edition on this week's and bloody hell. All that and more on this week's edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also this week, Mr. Stockton, GM is constantly raising the price of the EVs you were thinking of buying. There is a new IEA, International Energy Report, that's going to blow your renewable doubting uncle's mind. All kinds of other things, too. How are you doing this week? It is a cold one out there where we live in southern Canada. Yeah, super, super cold. Um, I have an update on radon, which is something we haven't talked about in a long time. From the early days of the podcast, we sort of talked about this, and it doesn't technically have anything to do with clean. It was originally called the Radon Show. The Radon Show, yeah. Um, so not technically anything to do with clean energy, but it does have to do with the upgrades that I've been making in my house as I try and make it more uh, energy efficient and get rid of fossil fuels and improve the uh, air quality in the house. So I started taking radon measurements a few years ago and they were um, like 200 on the scale. If you're below 200 on the scale, it's like you maybe don't have to deal with it or have to deal with it too quickly. If it's above 200 on the scale, then that's parts per million or something, I'm not sure. Radon is a gas, a, a gas you can't see or smell that can seep into your house. And it's particularly bad where we live. And apparently it's related to like uranium in the soil or something, radiation in the soil. And it's a, you know, a gas that can seep up into your house and if you uh, breathe enough of it for long enough, you might end up with uh, lung cancer. Bad. Yeah, lung cancer is bad. So anyway, um, when I started doing the readings, they're around 200. So it was like, okay, we'll deal with it, but you know, not, not a huge hurry. And uh, I bought a radon meter, which I loaned to you, and you checked out your radon. Um, anyway, for the, several months, right? I, I had it in my home for, uh, yeah. you do it for a long period of time. Yeah. Usually in the winter when the, it's sealed up. Yeah. You've got to do it in the winter and I've, I've run the meter in the summer and it's not a problem because we just have all the windows open most of the yeah. time. But, uh, anyway, the number has been creeping up lately and it's, it's above 400 now. Ooh. So, why do you think it's creeping up? Yeah. I'm not sure. It's just, it's just one of these things that kind of changes. And I did put like a, a couple of years ago, I put in a heat recovery ventilator. Which and it's is, worse now. It, it is worse now. Like the, the ventilator seemed to maybe help at first. Um, that was sort of my guess. I thought the, the ventilator might be enough to fix the problem. Um, but, you know, it wasn't. So uh, we've got the radon guy coming in a couple of weeks and he's going to put in one of those pipes. They kind of put a pipe down into the soil below your house to, to vent it to the outside. And, so that's uh, in the middle of your house, right? Like uh, they'll put it through your basement floor type of thing? Yeah, I think maybe where the sump hole is, there's a drainage sump hole. So they'll put in a pipe, they'll put in a fan, that'll hopefully vent it. I, I think. So it's constantly sucking air out of underneath your house, basically. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, just hmm. decided to finally go ahead with that. It'll it's be about $3,000 and uh, they're going to do it in a couple of weeks. Yeah, which is ironic because you and your partner are heavy smokers. <laughs> I wonder if you were, though. I mean, if it'd be... <laughs> I think the smoke would get you first. I wouldn't worry about it if... Uh... Well, yeah, you could do something about the radon, though. You, it's harder to quit smoking. <laughs> yeah, so that's anyone probably... Anyone trying to quit smoking out there, you have my sympathy. Well, I've been trying to quit radon for years now, man. The addiction <laughs> yeah. to radon has got me. Well, let us know how it goes and, and describe, you know, if your readings go down and such. We'll keep in touch on that topic. Yeah. Uh, so GM is uh, up dating the prices. You know, I've been wanting to buy an EV to replace our um, Prius 
and uh, GM has the cheapest ones, the Chevy Bolt. Uh, my friends I had breakfast with this morning were talking about getting those. They also said that all their friends here in the Prairie Agricultural Centre of Southern Prairies of Canada hate EVs and don't know why, but they do. Yep. So it's just a lot of bad things out there. They're both from small towns, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, the you know, they, they announced the Chevy Equinox, small crossover EV, but bigger than the Bolt. And it was supposed to be priced less than the Bolt. And so they lowered the Bolt in the States by quite a bit mm -hmm. in price. They did not do that in Canada where I live. And uh, they announced the, the, the Equinox at something like $33,000. or $33, Then it was $35,000 on their website. Yeah. Then it was $38,000. <laughs> and I think now it might even be forty. So it's constantly going up even before... It's just I've been monitoring that, and I'm not happy about that because I needed it to be cheaper yeah. than the Bolt so that the Bolt price would come down because I don't want to buy the Bolt. Yeah. If its price is going down, it's kind of bad to buy a used, you know, have a vehicle that's value goes down. But Well, given the demand, like they probably should have priced it on that higher range. Like we all want cheaper EVs, and they're coming. It's just with the demand the way it is right now. They're trying to make a statement saying, hey, yeah. you know, you can get a cheap EV here, but just not now. It's too soon. It's going to take a few years. Yeah. Uh, so, Brian, last week I disclosed that my beautiful Nissan Leaf from 2013 has no heater. Yeah. And as I said, and as we said many times on the show to the, uh, the point of amazement of our listeners, we live in a very cold place. Very cold. I don't know how stupidly cold it is, but it's... It was minus 21 when I went and took my daughter to school this morning. Yeah. Without a heater. Yeah. Celsius. Yeah. It's, that is... It's still minus, minus 21 right now. Minus 4 Fahrenheit. Could you, that? Could you try again? <laughs> my watch started interrupting us. And tonight... Tonight, Brian, it is going down to minus 35 Celsius. One night only. Yeah. For a short period of time, minus 35 Celsius, which is minus 31 Fahrenheit, with, I read on Twitter, a wind chill of minus 52 Celsius. Yeah, I hate that. Not, this is, not that the wind chill affects the cars. It only affects things that evaporate, like your skin. Yeah. Uh, but that's minus 61 Fahrenheit. Now, I, a lot of people are just... I, I can see a lot of our listeners jumping around on one foot right now thinking, ah, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and I agree with you. So if there's any listeners out there that will move Brian and I to a warm climate, yes. have some property that we could build on, I'm thinking Hawaii. I'd be but, fantastic. You know, it, Hawaii, nice, you can come back to your cottage in the summertime mm -hmm. and, and still be a part of the scene here. But my God, I'm, <laughs> I'm too old for this. It's it's especially without a heater in my car because it's a four thousand dollar fix. So I survived it though. I uh, it was getting to be a challenge. Um, uh, most of our weather is going to be warmer than this, okay? But there's this is a brief cold snap. It was a challenge. I bought that little thing from Amazon that blew lukewarm air at the window. Yeah. Didn't do much at yeah. all. And you plug it into the cigarette lighter. Yeah, it comes on with the car and off with the car, so I never touch it. It's just constantly going when the car is turned on, and it doesn't do much. Um, it, it's a problem keeping the windows defogged when it's this cold. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow morning. I'm, what I am hoping is that it's going to be too cold for my partner's work because they do transport um, social work clients around and it's dangerously cold so yeah. that they have a cutoff. I'm hoping to, to have access to her car. But it is it's nasty. But you know what, Brian? I am surviving. Yeah. I am surviving. It's my own fault I don't have the money. And I... Uh, I'm just eating it, and it's it's going okay so far. Do you have to drive around with the windows down so that it doesn't no, fog up? No, don't talk that way. <laughs> <laughs> that could be tomorrow. Uh, I, I do wear, you know, winter clothing and a neck thingy, and, yeah. you know, as if I was skiing in the, in the Arctic or something. I do dress warmer. My daughter, on the other hand, not so much, so I'm hoping she dresses warm tomorrow morning or she's going to be at Popsicle by the time I get her to school. Anyway, uh, there is a new IEA report just hot off the press uh, out this week. It is uh, talking about how renewables are going, and the world is set to add as much renewable power in the next five years as it did the whole past 20 years. So basically, the past 20 years is the whole time that I've been thinking about renewables yeah. in any significant way, um, because that's when wind turbines and solar were just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, it's been a 20 year span and that's going to all happen again, output wise in five short years. Wow. And of course the five years after that will be even greater. So yeah, things are going fast. So the global renewable capa power capacity is now expected to grow by 2,400 gigawatts uh, over the next um, five years and an amount equal to the entire power capacity of China today. So the entire power capacity of China, everything, coal, everything, nuclear, is going to be what we're going to get in renewables in just five years. So that's a pretty significant thing, considering China is one of the major users of electricity. No, so that's... Of China's around. That is absolutely amazing and great news. So this massive expected increase is 30% higher than the amount of growth that was forecast just a year ago. I think that is the headline for us. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. This is 30% more than they... You know, the idea that we talk about all the time on the show, mm -hmm. things are taking off, people underestimate things. Yeah. This and, is the S-curve you know, taking luck. off. Yeah. And no one, no one, no one is, is figuring this out. No one is. Unless you listen to our show, then you're smart, of course. Smartest listeners in uh, podcasting, as far as I'm concerned. So renewables are set to account for 90% of global electricity expansion over the next five years. So... Yeah, I'd like to see that 100%, but still, it's basically everything that gets added to the power grid is going to be renewable, all 9 out of 10 kilowatts, if you will. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be the largest source of global electricity by early 2025. And some updates to uh, past stories and, and things like that that I'd like to uh, just uh, touch on again. Uh, there's somebody here from the Tesla Owners Club, where we live, uh, who went cross-country skiing. I... I, I caught my eye because this is something I would do if I was mm -hmm. uh, healthy yeah. and had a Tesla. And uh, the two things that I aspire to be. <laughs> <laughs> I would go cross-country skied off somewhere with my Tesla. And she says that uh, she went cross-country skiing uh, on the ski trails. It's 100 kilometers away from the, uh, the city of Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we picked up our friend, took the Tesla, skied for a couple of hours, and his wife got... Uh, chilled. So we were still on the trails and I got out my phone and turned up the heat in the car. This is without turning on the car. And we got back to the car and Jan was shivering by that point. And we get in and we'll load our skis and get in the car. And the, it was just toasty hot in there. So it was instantly hot. And this is just another, you know, advantage to EVs. You can heat yep. them without turning them on, even from an app. Yeah. No, we, uh, my partner and I, we often go for a walk in the morning around the lake. Um, and I, I'm always mad at myself. So like, you know, five minutes before the end of the walk, I turn on the heat on the car when it's chilly out. And every once in a while I forget and I'm so mad at myself. Um, I, we could just leave the heat on the whole time, but uh, that, that's a bit wasteful. Well, you could set it to like um, a cooler temperature, you know. Yeah, like, uh, just set say, it. Say 14, yeah. 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. so that's half decent. I don't know. Uh, how long's your walk tank? 45 minutes. Yeah, you could do that. You could do that. Set it to around 10, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I might do that some days. Uh, from Green Car Reports, the U.S. motor clubs are, um, they're known for their roadside service, like American Automobile Association and Canada, the CAA, it's called, Canadian Automobile Association. And um, they are trying to, you know, get behind EV adoption as best they can. So they have an update to trip services with charging stations now. So if you use their trip service, you will see EV charging stations on them. And more than a decade after launching a mobile EV charging pilot program, they were right on top of this. This is quite, quite early to be on top of this. Uh, AAA is launching a second larger scale program that will offer mobile charging to members in 14 U.S. metropolitan areas. So they're expanding it to 14 big cities in the United States uh, for people in electric cars who run out of electrons, as it were. Yeah. And of course, they'll deliver you a, a can of gas as one of their <laughs> services. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is something I've definitely been waiting for. And it's something people always ask when they're new to electric vehicles is what happens when you run out of electricity? And this will be the perfect solution. They'll just come, they'll plug in your car for five minutes. It'll give you enough juice to get to a charging station. Um, but currently, 
you know, you, you have to get loaded onto a flatbed uh, truck and get towed. Yeah, and that has not happened to you or I. If you're new to the show, nope. it has not happened to Brian. You did arrive in your driveway with 0% once. Yes, yeah. So that was kind of That super cold road trip last uh, last year, last winter at Christmas time. And uh, that was a little bit dicey, but yeah, so far after two and a half years have never been stranded. So the worst that I've gotten is about down to 18 kilometers of range. And I've got a short range vehicle. And my city is only 18 kilometers long. I looked at it on a map. <laughs> yeah. So plus they give you extra than the, what they say. Yes. You know, they give you some, and then it starts to ramp down and gets, you know, you can only go at a low speed and you can't accelerate very fast at the very, very end of it. Mm -hmm. And people have done that on YouTube and experimented, but it's not something I, it's not something I ever expect to do, you know, but it, it is a nice peace of mind, yeah. especially if you're new to EVs and you have, you know, everybody seems to have range anxiety, at least for the first couple of weeks and mm -hmm. then it sort of gets worked out and everything is fine. So if you have a AAA membership, you can you know, not worry about it. Yeah. So the charging is for free to AAA members in San Francisco, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Orlando, Nashville, Charlotte, Denver, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, seems like an odd choice. Okay. Avalon, Peabody, and West Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and Bend and Portland, Oregon. So if you're in those cities, you might want to consider a AAA membership if you have or are thinking of buying an EV and think that they can't do anything for you. Well, now they can. They can. It's an, and it's not just towing you to a charger. And plus, remember, um, all EVs come with a basic charger that you can plug into a regular wall outlet. And I've always, you know, thought like I'd stop at the Wendy's or something that has like a, you know, um, a worker plug-in. Yeah. We, we have those here. They're more common. But there's plug-ins on the sides of buildings, even restaurants and offices. And, yep. Or you could just stop at a house, just yep. run it up to the house if it's the middle of the night and you want to be sneaky and get seven, five, seven kilometers an hour of charging. The Guardian, Brian Stockton, is out with a new report that claims that Tesla hate is on the rise. Have you found this? Not personally, no. Good, good. I'm almost surprised. Um, resulting in drivers ex experiencing more road rage. So that's unfortunate. Tesla drivers interviewed by The Guardian say they have experienced anti-Tesla sentiment, but mostly from those who hate electric vehicles rather than Musk specifically. Random rude drivers will swerve into my lane and yell at me or turn on a heavy diesel exhaust that blows smoke back at me. Paul Albertson, who lives in Beaverton, Oregon, told The Guardian. I don't know what The Guardian's doing in Oregon, but there you have it. It never happens when he drives his two other cars, a, a vintage 48 Chevy and a 2014 Traverse. And the culprits are most often men driving larger pickup trucks uh, with just a tad too much testosterone. Yeah, happened to me once on the highway where I got coal rolled by a big truck who, uh, you know, beefed up their exhaust as they went past me. And did you pass them? Did you leave them in your dust? It well, we were going in opposite directions. Oh, okay. We I think all Tesla should come with uh, coal rolling uh, capsules or tanks in them to just oh, coal just... roll them back. <laughs> <laughs> that would be unexpected. <laughs> well, if Elon Musk gets to thinking that way, then well, I don't know. Uh, okay, so, so France. Yeah, we had. Spoken about this a while ago when it was initially proposed, and it has now been finalized. So France is trying to ban short-haul flights. So flying in an airplane uses a lot more carbon than other forms of transportation. And if it's a short flight that can be covered by rail or bus or some other um, form of transportation, you know, why are we flying? We shouldn't. And so uh, France has stepped up, and they have banned... Uh, short haul commercial flights that can also be covered by rail. So there were eight routes that they were planning to ban and uh, they ended up going down to just three. They had to get this approved from the European Commission. And the other ones, they sort of decided, the European Commission decided that maybe there wasn't enough rail transport for long enough hours that people would be inconvenienced too much if they, they banned all eight routes. So they're starting with three and I think that will eventually expand. Um, and they're talking about putting limits on private jets. And this is less specific, and I, I don't know um, exactly how that's going to play out. But private jets are, of course, a really bad 
for carbon because you know you're you're only moving like a handful of people around rich people around the world um hopping around on private jets is very very uh carbon intensive and um they're picking on uh steven spielberg in this particular article this is from electric um an example of total excess director steven spielberg's private jet reportedly burned more than $116,000 in jet fuel in two months this summer. That's 179 tons of CO2 into the air. And this is according to flight tracking data from the ADSB um, exchange. So, uh, yeah, rich people flying around the world in private jets, um, huge source of carbon. And, you know, while we don't have the details yet, France is looking to start putting limits on uh, how many of these flights they're going to allow. So a private jet can be one person. Yeah. You know, getting that jet off the ground, or yeah. it could be uh, a half dozen people. Yeah. But it's it's not a full flight of people. There's the two pilots, which have to go, but they're no. not really needing to go anywhere. So, yeah, it's a, it's a high-carbon situation. Now, I saw a, um, I guess, a, a bit of a study, or at least a paper on the France banning thing, and... They said that it wasn't going to make that big of a deal because the short haul flights are only 5% of carbon emissions from flights. It's those long haul flights that get you. Mm -hmm. But maybe the private jet flights are, you know, more significant too. Yeah. But, you know, the rich people are going to fight back. They have power. No. And I've got a couple other stories. There was something from, um, uh, where is it? Clean Technica um, had a report that. Uh, jet fuel use overall in the U.S. is, is actually down compared to 2019 uh, before the pandemic. Took a big dip, of course, during the pandemic, and now we're kind of back to a kind of a steady state, but it's a little bit lower than 2019. So it does sound like maybe people are choosing to fly um, a little bit less. Yeah, there's, I think some of it has to do with the pandemic. Um, which is still, getting, yeah, which is it's still lingering. It still exists, yeah. and people are, or I mean, people like me probably would fly less, even if I had the choice right now to fly, yeah. uh, just because of that reason. I mean, you came back from a flight and you were, yeah, full of COVID. So I've was it COVID or a cold? It was a cold. You got on the I flight. got a cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've flown once in the last five or six years. And, uh, but now that I'm retired, I am hoping to fly some more. So like, I'm starting to kind of look into the idea of maybe, you know, purchasing carbon offsets, which is not, I don't know. It, it's, um, it's a lot of people hate those. Man. A lot of people a lot hate of people the carbon hate. offsets, but I kind of feel like if I'm going to take a long trip to the UK or something, I'd like to do something to offset the carbon. Well, there, there is kayaks, you know, I've got two kayaks here I can lend you. Okay. Uh, perfectly good paddles. You get yeah. the right wind behind you. Yeah. Maybe make a little sail. Okay. <laughs> big cooler. You know, you put a big <laughs> cooler on there. Or a fishing rod if you want to just catch your own fish. And sharks. No, the sharks will eat you quickly. So the Times in the UK has says that a number of tweets mentioning, the number of tweets mentioning the term climate scam have surged following Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter in what one senior UN official called an alarming flood of environmental misinformation that is happening all of a sudden since the takeover. And analysis for the Times has also revealed that 2022 was the worst year for content skeptical of climate change since the social media giant was founded. And we'll talk a little bit how some of that is fueled, ironically, choice of words there, by the fossil fuel industry. They are behind it. Petrol states are also behind it. They want that a lot. So Power Magazine, there are indications that nuclear power could ramp up again in Japan sooner rather than later. Because we've mentioned this before on the show, so I wanted to mention that, you know, it is apparently possibly coming back. Uh, soaring energy costs have forced both a policy rethink by governments toward nuclear and a change in the public's opinion about nuclear after Fukushima. Because, you know, get you in the wallet, you want to maybe consider ramping up some of those closed reactors. My daughter uh, showed me a Brazilian model who is a uh, nuclear influencer <laughs> last night. Okay. She was young. Aesthetically pleasing and dressed like 
a supermodel, mm-hmm. you know, fashion forward, okay. very fashionable. You, she looks like an influencer, and you know, a makeup influencer, uh, uh, I'm living the best life influencer, you know, the type of people. They're, they're not me, Brian. Yeah. I'm not an influencer. You have to be gorgeous to be an influencer. No, and... She's a nuclear influencer. She wants the world to go to nuclear. She's done a TED Talk that she was shown in... My daughter was shown in school. She wanted to show it to me, and it made me angry. My daughter regretted showing it to me. Is she employed by the nuclear industry? Well, that's what I said, and she claims she's not, but she's also not very articulate. <laughs> she's not making, very, you know, great arguments either. But yeah, she's well, an influencer, so people listen. We covered about a year ago um, a story about uh, the natural gas industry was paying, uh, you know, online influencers to promote natural gas for cooking and stuff. Yeah, like, and we know that's a scam because it's uh, it's leaking. It's leaking out of your kitchen right now if you have got natural gas in your kitchen. Um, yeah, so I thought I mentioned that. Plug-in electric vehicles took. 89.3% share of the auto market in Norway in November. Now, since we started the show, we've been gasping in how the percentage of auto sales in Norway has just shot up and it's it's peaked because now it's down because mm. uh, that is actually down from 91.2% year on year. So they peaked and they're coming back down just a tinch now that everybody has got their vehicle or they're waiting for a new one. Or perhaps there's a short and short supply of them, but that's kind of where it's sitting right now. Yeah, that includes plug-in hybrids, I believe. Right, it does, and as does a lot of the, uh, you know, gas car bans by states like California and countries like Canada. Uh, and people say, well, you know, you're, you're going to force me to buy an electric car. Well, it's going to be a gas car, but it's going to have a plug-in on it, so you can use it or you can not use it. By then, everyone's going to have one anyway. I can't imagine selling a car in 2035 that doesn't have a plug-in on it. Yeah. So full electric BVs grew. This is the good news in that story. The full electric battery electric vehicles grew their share year over year from 73.8 to 81.6, which is fairly significant. So yeah, the um, the plug-in hybrids you speak of are starting to fall off and people are opting and trusting in battery electric vehicles. And November's best overall seller was the Tesla Model Y. No surprise there. Yeah. Now, Brian, the uh, the Tesla had their semi uh, delivery day, they call it. Yeah. So it's one of these things that is a Tesla event that you watch online if you're streaming. You watched, of course. Yes. It's a Tesla shareholder. You own forty percent of the company, something like something that. Like that. Um, it. It was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it made me feel, you know, because I have such ill feelings about uh, Musk, but he was you know, not doing anything stupid until the show was over. <laughs> and then he was on Twitter doing something stupid. But, I mean, he was uh, talking about the things that he, he he's on this earth to do, and that is to, to solve the um, emissions from transportation. And um, it felt like an old-time Tesla event, you know, like a, I had, you know, chills yeah. from it you know it's just like really cool stuff going on so i'll just go over it for you and and try to convince you why this is significant so tesla has made a 500 mile run in their semi trailer that has fully loaded it has a estimated 900 kilowatt hour battery which is maybe nine times the biggest battery in cars or the bigger batteries in cars not trucks but cars they tend to peak around 100 kilowatt hours uh, maybe a bit more. So, which would represent the top version of the truck expected to sell one hundred eighty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, this is a, a a big rig semi truck. Yeah. A lot of people said this was impossible. This is why this particular thing is important. Yeah. Because it was fully loaded. It did a five hundred mile journey. It was only charged to ninety seven percent. It had a few percent left over, so there was some buffer in there, and it went along. A place uh, through Colorado, I believe, and they've done testing there. The point is they put a YouTube video of it up, the whole thing, so in case anyone doubted it. The driver took uh, something like one break to go to the bathroom, which is, you know, there was no charging along the way. So Mm -hmm. all he did is do this with a full load, full semi-load. And they did it. And, and, um, you know, um, Bill Gates, other people like him have said, no, this is physically impossible. Um, Nicola, CEO, who's now in jail or whatever, charged. 
he said it was against yep. physics. So a lot of people said this was not possible. And a lot of the other truck makers were saying it was not possible. They did it. And they did it with the things that you like to talk about, the efficiency of their motors and inverters and things like that. They also did it with aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a very mm -hmm. aerodynamic um, rig. And they also use, it's important to note, their own um, designed uh, trailer. So the trailer has to go with it, okay? So it's probably a little bit lighter, but yeah. it's also a complement to the aerodynamics of the tractor, okay? So the mm -hmm. key unknown is how much the Tesla Semi itself weighs. We don't know that yet, but it must be subtracted from the maximum 82,000 82, uh, pound gross weight of truck and trailer to get a total payload that the Semi can pull for. If you're an investor, you want to know that number. And for comparison, some of the other people who are making these electric uh, big rigs, um, VNR has uh, 275 miles, and Freightliner has a model that offers 230 miles, which is less than half, and the Nikola TRE boasts 330 miles of range. So these there are other electric things out there. BY, BY, BYD has one, the Chinese uh, automaker has uh -huh. one that has been operating at ports in the west coast of North America for you know, grocery stores, short haul trips, stuff like that. So 500 miles fits pretty nicely with a time at which drivers are mandated to take a 30 minute break after eight hours of driving, creating a natural time to charge. A uh, 70% charge is set to take 30 minutes. Yeah, the only issue right now is not enough charging stations. So is there going to be a charger at that exact point where you're supposed to take your 30 minute break? And I think at this point, the answer is no. But obviously, this is early days, and this whole charging infrastructure will now, get Now, they are out. manufacturing these, finally. They're, what, two, three years late, three years late, something like that? And yep, they are making late. them. So they're rolling off the assembly line and getting delivered to Pepsi and Frito-Lay. I saw a Bloomberg um, opinion piece, which had originally uh, said this was not possible, saying, well, they're they're doing potato chips and that's good. It's good because there's lots of things that you can do that are light. Not everything's <laughs> heavy, but they pulled a full load in that video. So I don't know. The point is though, that the people who are buying these are having scheduled loads that go from A to B. They know the destination. It's, it's, you know, Budweiser brewery to distribu distribution center yep. A. That's the, you know, they know how long it is. They mm -hmm. know how many trips they make. And they're doing that and they're going to save money doing it and they're going to test it and they'll give lots of data back. And uh, the great thing about these semis is that they're using the electric motors from the Plaid, the performance version of the Model S sedan. So that they didn't invent anything new. They just put three motors in there that, that they already <laughs> had, which were already efficient. <laughs> and what I found interesting as kind yeah. of a you know, techno geek is that uh, they've geared the one motor to work uh, at highway speed for efficiency. You know, like you have a first gear, you wouldn't drive in first gear if you had a manual transmission on the highway, yeah. you drive in fifth gear. Well, what this is, yeah. is basically like fifth gear. So the, the motor doesn't have to run yeah. at a high RPM, it runs at a low, but you have less torque there. But because they're electric motors, it still has plenty of torque. So when it needs yeah. torque, when it needs to go from standstill to driving or up a grade, uh, it will employ two more motors, which seamlessly take over Without a drop off of the torque, because it's an electric motor, they can seamlessly take over and add to it. And apparently, it's uh, significantly more powerful than uh, diesel. Okay, so this is, you know, yeah. right now, if you're a person who drives diesel and you, you want to drive one, plus it's easy because there's no gears in it. Uh, there's, I don't know how yeah. many gears there is in a semi. Okay, I'm a bit naive about that, but there's no gears in this, yeah. right? So anybody can drive it. Well, I guess there's technically gears as you're describing them, but right. it drives like you an automatic You don't have to car. change anything. So in that sense, that's the yeah. hardest part of driving a semi, aside from getting around corners. That's, you know, half the battle and the other half is the gears. Yeah. So you still have to get around those corners and, and understand how to, to drive a trailer in that way. But uh, it's just, it seems like, you know, like this is a just really good technology that will improve. They call it a step change in in uh, big rigs. So each motor has the same as it has a plaid. It can go to zero to 60 in 20 seconds, which is not impressive, but from a truck that weighs 17 times as much as a, a full-on electric car, that's pretty good. 
It's aimed at efficiency, not performance, too. And big rigs, as they pointed out in the presentation, are just 1% of vehicles on U.S. roads, but account for one-fifth of the vehicle emissions and, you know, 36% of the particulate emissions, which is, uh, that's according to Tesla. Particulate emissions is the type that causes smog in cities and bad air quality around highways. If you, They pointed out that if you live near a highway, the future is looking good for you once we get, to, you know, get diesel off the road. Yeah, so, that's, and uh, also, that's amazing. you know, there's a $40,000 tax credit coming for large electric trucks. So that's going to make the uh, economics case pretty, pretty incredible. So, you know, they're going to ramp up to, I don't know, 50,000 a year in a few years, 2025 or so. Uh, mm -hmm. But for now, they're going to get out there. The the big companies that, that haul a lot of stuff, the grocery stores, Loblaws in Canada is doing it, Budweiser, uh, Frito-Lay, PepsiCo, and, and Coke. And they're all going to use these and give feedback from their workers, from the truck drivers, and from just the logistics of it. And they'll put chargers in, hopefully, at their freight locations, at their warehouses. So if once you stop, you charge it, you plug it in, unload the vehicle, and then go on your way next time. So, yeah, that's just very interesting. Yeah, it'll take them a while to ramp up. And I think like they're planning to make 50,000 of them in 2024, I think. So throughout the next year, they'll be kind of ramping up their production. So uh, we always wish these things would go faster. But if we think of that five-year timeline that we we're just talking about from the IEA, all the new clean grid energy that's going to come online in the next five years, there'll be a significant number of these electric semis on the roads and uh, they five have, years from now. You know, like all electric trucks, they will have um, sort of instant uh, access to the computer. Like they'll be able to adjust the wheels instantly, unlike with a transmission vehicle, yeah. like a diesel vehicle. And they say that they'll be able to reduce uh, jackknifing, which is something we see in a winter climate yeah. here all the time. It shuts down highways. Yep. I saw one just a week ago on my drive to Moose Jaw, and there was a semi-trailer. I mean, I didn't see it go in, but there was a semi-trailer on its side in the ditch between the two highways. And, uh, you know, it was just a little windy and a little icy. So I look at the, the road report for the area when it's uh, when there's a winter storm, and there's all these little demarcations like, you know, jackknife semis uh, use alternate route and because you know, they're blocking the road and, and then yeah. you can't get them out. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they cause pileups. So yeah. hopefully that will, be, it will you know, trucks are, are dangerous on the highway. Hopefully this gets made safer. There was no talk, by the way, of uh, automation for driving or, you know, autopilot or anything like that yet. We'll see what's, what's coming with that. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we didn't get quite enough information about it, but the charging infrastructure. So this is supposed to charge at uh, yeah, this up is to something one we've been megawatt. Speculating on the is, whole time of this podcast, right? Yeah. And it's one megawatt is the answer. So this is four, four times as much juice as the typical uh, 250 kilowatt Tesla charger. And they revealed that the Cybertruck is going to use the same in, in you know, uh, guts. So it could potentially charge up to one megawatt with a 1000 volt architecture. So yeah, this is the next version of the, the fast charging from, from Tesla. And, uh, I, I want to hear more about it. It's but, very uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah we, we sort of get frustratingly little details. They just put out nuggets kind of awkwardly and, uh, we have to sort of, yeah. uh, wait for them to be filled in from a tweet usually. <laughs> uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's, it's just. It's going to be incredible. And the Cybertruck as a fleet, as a company tool too, like the pickup truck, if you can charge that, that's going to open up a more use patterns for it if it can charge at one megawatt because that will fill up pretty fast. And, you know, the connectors, we were talking about how the rest of the auto industry settled on a megawatt connector for trucks, but it's big. The Tesla one, Brian, is not. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. impossibly small, I would say. And they've it's got water right yeah. into the cables, apparently, to cool them. Like water circulates right through the copper. Although, again, I wasn't quite clear if this was a new connector I believe for it is. the semi. They, it, yeah, so it is a, a larger well, they also connector referred to than it the as other version one, I think. four. So you'd have to wonder if that's coming yeah. to other cars. Like if, uh, you know, a, a Model S two years from now might have this as well. We don't know. But it, it could be. 
and which would make I, it very yeah. interesting. And, te and Tesla would have a big uh, advantage. Um, well, we picked a good time to make a podcast about clean energy and transportation because there's just uh, tons of exciting yeah, stuff going on. Yeah, and that's something we've been anticipating. So, by the way, I just wanted to say that you know how um, people are always saying electric cars will burn, and what Tesla Semi there's lots of Tesla Semi burning jokes because they're electric, because they're battery electric. Well, there was a car yeah. that burned like two blocks from me. The person died. They hit a pole in the morning, and yeah. Um, it, it it blew up, you know. Gas cars go on fire way more gas often. Gas cars, than electric cars, way more often. Uh, okay, so a story here from uh, North Carolina, and it's about a power outage. So they're into their third day without power in Moore County in North Carolina, and I just thought this was interesting because it was damage to the substations from intentional sabotage with uh, firearms. So basically somebody went in and shot up some substations wow. with guns. And uh, so this is proving to be a very difficult thing to fix. And they've been without power for three days now in uh, this county in North Carolina, 42,000 people, 42, 000, or 34,000 uh, utility customers in this uh, county. And because of the damage, it this could actually go on wow. for uh, several more days. I wonder if we'll see this again or if this is a one-off uh, instance, but it's it's truly weird when a, you know, power outages never happen on purpose. It, it is an yeah. exceptional thing here that you're talking about. And sometimes, you know, there'll be an accident, a truck or something will hit a pole. That happened uh, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. My son sent me a picture of that happening. And sure enough, there's this big power outage because... Somebody slid into a utility pool, mm -hmm. uh, but not intentionally. So this is, uh, yeah. You know. Let's hope it's not a trend. <laughs> Another argument for banning guns if you're in that side of the <laughs> argument. <laughs> <laughs> we have to ban guns because they're causing power outages. <laughs> it's okay. The murders are okay, but the power outages, well, that affects everyone. Rich and poor, so. Can't have that. From yep. the New York Times, the Texas group uh, is waging a national crusade against climate action. The New York Times has a huge piece, which I will put in our show notes, and it'll be free for you because I have a subscription. It'll be a gift link. The uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation is shaping laws, running influence campaigns, and taking legal action. They're backing legal action with their own money in a bid to promote fossil fuels. They bankrolled a lawsuit to halt a offshore wind development on the U.S. Northeast Coast. We Something we talked about a few weeks ago on the show. These were the guys behind it. Mm -hmm. it was the fossil fuel industry was trying to create all the fuss and the delays. And and uh, I've got a clip here that's coming up in a second. That's just like, okay. get out the clean energy show defibrillator, Brian, because we're going to need it. Clear. <laughs> Uh, we should have a clean energy show branded defibrillator because this is just, uh, just everyone sit down. If you're listening at home, sit down, calm down, because this is going to make you angry. So the fishing companies that were challenging the federal permits for wind turbines off of New England were actually funded by this Texas foundation who's fossil, fossil fuel funded. And they featured a bearded fisherman with a distinct... New England accent. And here is a short clip of that New England fisherman supposedly talking. Once these platforms are put in place, that ground is lost forever. So you're sacrificing hundreds of years of production of food for a 25 year plan that is bound to fail. They haven't worked anywhere in the world. Just going to leave some dead air there for a second. Wind turbines have not worked anywhere in the world. You heard it here first. I, I need the defibrillator. <laughs> I need the defibrillator. There. There's a bit of a shot for you. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's going to make the fish go away and for hundreds of years for something that hasn't worked anywhere in the world. Well, don't the, don't the fish have... You know, so fish fish the fish yeah. somewhere else. <laughs> the fish, th they do study these things, the impact on fish, and it's not n nothing. Yeah. But they don't make the fish go away. 
that's ridiculous. It's, 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 it's all nonsense. And even after yeah. Democrats in Congress passed the biggest climate law in the United States in history this summer, the organization is undaunted and is continuing its efforts to highlight, highlight the myriad forces working to keep oil, gas, and coal companies in business. In Arizona, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, if you ever hear that word again, uh, cringe because it is cringeworthy, campaigned to keep one open one of the biggest fossil fuel co uh, coal plants in the West. In Colorado, it called for looser restrictions on hydraulic fracturing. And in Texas, the group crafted the first so-called energy boycott law to punish financial institutions that want to scale back their investments in fossil fuel projects. So yeah, you can't, We you know, it's a free country unless you do something against fossil fuels. You know, freedom, 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 except uh, you don't have a choice if you don't want to f fund fossil fuels. We have to have a law for that. So they've got behind that list. It's just insane, Brian. It's insane. And it's we, we, we're we at a critical yeah. point where we can't have any delays. We can't screw around. We can't mm -hmm. let these people win in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you have to fight back, people. At the same time, the Texas Public Policy Foundation has spread misinformation about climate science. Nice. With YouTube videos, regular appearances on Fox and Friends. Well, that's a surprise. And social media campaigns, the group's executives have sought to convince lawmakers and the public that a transition away from oil, gas, and coal would be harmful to Americans. Yeah. Right. Well, just the stupid people are going to listen to you. This is a good topic for John Oliver on HBO. Was, uh, last week tonight this would be a good, yeah. good thing for him. They have frequently seized on current events to promote dubious narratives, pinning high gasoline prices on President Biden's climate policies, which is bogus, of course. Which haven't really no. <laughs> even been enacted yet. Economists say that's not the driver. Or claiming the 21, 2021 uh, blackout in Texas was the result of unreliable wind energy. They were the people behind that. We talked about that on the show before. Screw them. Yeah, that was a, a big news story that we talked about on the show. And it was kind of like you could sort of definitely source out both viewpoints on that if you're a fossil fuel person and you google it in a certain way you can you know reinforce your belief that it was uh, clean energy that caused those blackouts in texas but uh, that's certainly not what we reported on no i mean we they've studied it it's natural truth. gas was the big i mean there was some wind turbines that failed because they didn't have de-icing technology well that was the fault of um i guess the the utility they thought that they would never use it. It would be a one in 50 year event. So, well, the event happened and they were caught with yeah. their pants down. Yeah. Yes. Which is related to yeah. climate change because it's making the weather a bit more weird than it normally would be. And that and event was caused by climate change. So it's not just global warming. It's a change in the climate. Uh, things that don't normally happen yeah. are happening or uh, very rare events are happening more often. Uh, okay, so um, recently on the show, we reported on a project that would connect Ireland and France, uh, their electricity grids, so that they could exchange electricity back and forth between um, Ireland and France. And, uh, but, which, you know, in itself was sort of surprising, because that's a fair distance. But speaking of distance, um, the UK is going to now put in an undersea cable linked to a solar and wind farm in the Sahara Desert. The, the whole which, thing's going to be uh, under know, the I'm ocean? You know, I'm not a huge... Between... Wow. Yes. Yes. The Sahara Desert. And I'm not a big no. geography no. guy. I don't know Nothing a lot really. about geography. It's, you know, one of my weakest okay. categories on Jeopardy. That's a shame. But, uh, man, this is far. So this is 2,300 miles or 3,800 kilometers. So this was announced a while ago, and I, I, I think we just didn't catch it at the time that it was announced. But this current story in The Guardian is about a delay to this project. So um, it's going to cost 18 billion pounds, which I think is around 21 billion dollars. And uh, but it's now going to be delayed by a year. And um, it's going to be coming uh, into force uh, sometime around 2027, I believe. But it's a, it's a year later than they had uh, originally planned. So that's planned. the Sahara Desert in Africa all the way to the United Kingdom. Underwater. Yeah. That's a long... 
So 3,800 yeah. kilometers, if I think about <laughs> driving down a highway at 100 kilometers an hour highway speed, that's 38 hours. So that would be, yeah. I don't know, here to Mexico, Canada, you know, the, the, the length of the United States, north Ye to south or something like that. Yeah, yeah, New York to yeah. L.A. maybe, something like that. But at the same time, it's actually, to me, actually closer than maybe I thought. Because, you know, you know, you don't oh, yeah. associate the U.K. being yeah. anywhere near the Sahara Desert, but... I, I would have just assumed that this is the thing that is not possible yeah. because it's too That's far away. really remarkable. And if this is happening now, and there's one from Australia to Singapore, right? I don't know how that compares. Yes, but, that's in the works as well. Uh, this is, you know, how renewables work. People say, not enough sunshine in the UK for solar. Well, fine. We'll run a, we'll run a cable. <laughs> run a cable. it's cost effective. For the Sahara Desert. To the Sahara, where yeah. there's, you know, gobs of sunshine because it's at the equator. Um, just uh, high solar potential. Wow. And, you know, you're not really wasting land because it's the desert, right? You're... Yeah. And uh, and the cable's just under the water. Uh, but, you know, it's very surprising. It it's surprising. even possible. <laughs> Let's get to the Tweet of the Week. This is coming from the CEO of Cruise. Cruise is GM's self-driving robo-taxi technology company. Okay, so they've got robo taxis in a couple of places, and Kyle Voigt, Vogt, 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 V O G T. How would you pronounce that? Vogt, Kyle Vogt. Vogt. Okay, he says the press. The press says things like AVs are overhyped and are still, you know, autonomous vehicles are overhyped and still five to ten years away. And us here at Cruise, we say this moment, there are a hundred Cruise autonomous vehicles in driverless mode in San Francisco and many currently carrying passengers. So they had a map, which you can see here, Brian, uh, of all the, the autonomous vehicles driving in San Francisco at night. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, people all on the naysayers of autonomous vehicles. But then I always say, you know, look at, they're there. There's autonomous vehicles driving without people right now, yeah. and they are working. They may not be working as great as they need to be, but they're not killing anyone, and they're not delaying too what? much traffic. No, and if we talk again about that five-year timeline, which we've been talking about on this episode, I would imagine, um, you know, a lot on the road in well, five years' time. It is finally time for the lightning round, a fast-paced look of the week in clean energy and climate news to round off this week's show. From the China EV Post and Bloomberg, VW is set to export China-made EVs to Europe. This is after Tesla and BMW are doing the same thing. So they're making the models cheaper uh, in China and then shipping them to Europe. Any thoughts? Um, well, it's probably a good strategy, although, you know, Apple made an announcement. Well, I don't know if it was an announcement, but uh, there was a story this week about Apple trying to move their production out of China due to the uh, uncertainties uh, in China, so that's probably yeah. The there's main been a thing lot of COVID with. absolute shutdowns just to uh, have zero tolerance, and it's been causing probably part of the reason why we don't have some of the things we need for our cars here. Uh, from Drive Tesla Canada, yeah. nearly two thirds of Ford dealerships in their network have opted to go for the EV certification program. They have to spend lots of money to do this. Earlier this year, Ford announced their EV certification program, giving their dealer network the option to decide if they want to continue to sell electric vehicles. The decision to opt in came with several commitments, including to spend as much as $1.2 million, which is not nothing for a dealership, and to add EV infrastructure, okay, and among other things, and they will only sell their EVs at a non-negotiable price. So EVs at Ford... You won't have to worry about haggling. I love that. Yeah, no, it's it's always been um, a, a real problem. And as we move into a more internet age for buying automobiles, it's something that the legacy automakers are going to have to deal with. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't crazy about their dealerships. And I wanted to mention, too, that um, Ford has now sold 150,000 uh, Mustang Mach-E's. And I believe they're coming in second yep. to Tesla in the U.S., um, not so much in the rest of the world, but um, 150,000 Mustang Mach-E electric vehicles, yeah, I mean, which is impressive. Yeah, I mean, we don't give Ford enough credit. 
uh, they don't get enough credit in this space. They they're producing the you there are Ford trucks, lightning all electric trucks driving around. So that's pretty cool. We need more, but they are coming through. So um, eleven percent of new vehicle sales globally are one hundred percent electric, according to Clean Technica. So we're at 11% globally, and this is 100% electric. Tesla Model Y and 3 have the top two spots, but the spots that are 3 to 8 are occupied by Chinese automakers, Brian, and then at number 9 is VW ID4, which is kind of a so-so EV, but they're making them. Yeah. I believe that BYD is second to Tesla worldwide. There was a chart on Clean Technica recently, so Tesla's making the most pure EVs, uh, BYD is second, um, SAIC. Yeah, that's one that of the, is. the third Chinese automakers. And then Volkswagen but I have here the number yeah. three selling vehicle, okay, model-wise, not brand-wise, but model-wise. The Y and the three are number one. And then the Mini EV, which is, you're looking at it here, it's it's tiny. We talked about it on the yeah. show before because it's I think it starts around $15,000. no. You, you can get one for $4,000 U.S. in China. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, it a is a bit of a cart. golf cart, but apparently people love them, and they're they're customizing them and making them on their own. And uh, the Mini EV can yeah. seat four people. It has standard features, including air conditioning. You'd think air conditioning would be $4,000 by itself, practically. Uh, power windows, a stereo system, storage, yay, compartments yay that's that's nice to have that standard uh the standard safety features of the mini ev include anti-lock brakes which is nice i've used mine regularly tire pressure monitoring sensors mm -hmm. and rear parking sensors something that no one had 15 20 years ago yeah well this is not dissimilar from your 2013 nissan leaf that you paid used vehicle you paid 10 grand for it and it absolutely gets you around it's not a highway car but absolutely early, gets you around the Mine's city. not tiny, though. Mine's quite comfortable. Um, you know, it's a mid-sized car in Canada. Yeah. A little uh, it's compact in the States, I guess, but by their standards. So early models do not include a driver airbag. So that's kind of unfortunate. But later models, such as the yeah. Mini EV Macaron, include the feature as standard. So, yeah, airbags I would want to have in my car, especially a tiny car. And that had a such mm -hmm. you know the cheapest car in china and they're selling them like crazy so they must have a reputation of reliability there must be a dealer network for servicing them um but really you can put four people in them but just too comfortably i would say but really it's all you need and i'm sure they're very cheap to operate i mean yeah uh, i think their batteries are are half of what the leaf is but they still uh, they still can get around because they're so small so uh, GM is opening a CAMI plant, a CMI plant in Ingersoll, Canada. It is Canada's first EV production facility to build Bright Drop Zevo delivery vans. Now, when I thought heard of this on the news, I was picturing sort of a tr Ford Transit, but these are bigger. These are fairly substantial vehicles. Yeah. They're basically small trucks. Yeah. Small delivery trucks. Yeah, no, this is... It's sort of like a cube van sized kind of uh, delivery it does. vehicle. It looks, it looks uh, fantastic. It'd be cool to see things like that on the road. They expect them to produce up to 50,000 of these suckers every year by 2025. So, yeah. No, this is a big deal. And the, the plant's already open. There was a big uh, ceremony with the prime minister. And uh, this is, it is. Uh, this is great. And, you know, so many little stories that we do. Uh, you know, 10,000 here, 50,000 there. This is going to put a dent in oil pretty quick. I think in a few years from now, we're going to start to see some serious uh, dent in oil demand. So, oh, it's time for CS Clean Energy Show Fast Fact. From Shannon Asaka, climate reporter for the Washington Post. People born in 1950 will have two times higher carbon footprints over the course of their lives than people born in 2020. Just because of how the U.S. energy mix has already changed. This applies to the United States. Yeah, well, all of that huge capacity the IEA was telling us about coming online, that, you know, the grid, everything gets cleaner every year. So Ford, speaking of Ford, Ford doubled their EV sales in uh, November on a year-over-year -year basis. So not only are they putting them out, they're ramping up. So that's good news from them. 
uh, police unlawfully spied on children as young as 10 taking part in a climate strike protest in London. Documents have shown the previously unseen papers revealed the Metropolitan Police there were rebuked by the Information Commissioner's Office for video surveillance of a March 2019 climate protest, which was attended by up to 10,000 children protesting uh, lack of uh, work on climate change and young people as well. Uh, Turkey's installed solar capacity has gone from virtually nothing a decade ago to nine gigawatts in 2022. So nothing to basically nine nuclear reactors worth at its peak output midday. Uh, you can't build nuclear reactors in a decade, Brian, but you can throw up a bunch of solar. It just goes to show. Let's Pretty quick uh, ramp up there. Uh, Toyota, sadly, uh, plans to uh, offer a bunch of EVs, but only in Europe. <laughs> yeah, way to go, Toyota. So the BZ and BZ branded EVs are coming, five of them, to Europe by 2026, but not here, not in North America, not anywhere else, just Europe. That's often the case, isn't it? A lot of times they just, people just you know, put all their EVs in Europe before anywhere else. From old LA, Los Angeles Times, uh, Los Angeles voted 12 to 0 to ban new drilling in the city and close all of its 5,000 existing oil and gas wells. Remember, we talked about this on the show before, how there's oil wells in the middle of L.A., and yep. how they're interestingly covered up by buildings and architecture. Yeah, you, you can drive past them and see them. There's uh, featured prominently in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, there's a nice shot of a, like, a drive-in theater with a. But they're still rig. there in the middle of the city. Yep. It's crazy. But they've banned it, so they do have to get rid of them eventually. I think it's... Uh, with, <laughs> they have 20 years to close them. But still, they're on the way out. They're going to be ripped up and moved, which couldn't happen soon enough. From Bloomberg, a group of children and young adults, including Greta Thunberg, have filed a class action lawsuit against the Swedish state for failing to take adequate measures to stop climate change. The lawsuit is part of an international wave of climate-related legal action. Brian, when you want something done, get a lawyer. Yeah, I'm a big fan of legal action to save the planet. And finally this week, from London, uh, their ultra-low emission zone is now going to cover the entire city next year. Remember how you have a low emission zone, you can't drive diesel or certain vehicles inside the city center without paying a $5 fee day, or 12 50 um, pounds. But uh, older high emission vehicles have been charged this in their uh, this zone, but now it's going to span not just central London and its inner boroughs, but all those um, going out to the edge of the city. So London will charge motorists citywide to drive more polluting vehicles, expanding devices policy that's improved air quality noticeably and accelerated the transition to electric vehicles. Two good things, Brian. That's fantastic. Yeah, I remember last summer, I, I don't often ride my bike in sort of crowded traffic areas. Like I'm usually riding on a trail or in the park or something. But I had to ride my bike last summer where there was a lot of traffic. And, oh, man, it was horrible. It was horrible. Yeah. The policy will extend to the city's outer reaches in August of next year, affecting about 15% of vehicles in the area, uh, newly becoming part of the zone. So, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Good for them. And good, uh, you know, I'd love to see air starting to clean up. It's nice. To, climate change doesn't get solved very quickly, but air pollution can. And that's a beautiful thing, especially when it has uh, uh, terrible health effects. That is our show for this week. We like to hear from you. We love to hear from you. We live to hear from you. So please get out your pen now and contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. That is our email address, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on Twitter, TikTok, Clean Energy Pod. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel to see visual representations of Brian and I of this podcast production. Or leave a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And consider donating to the show using the PayPal donate button, which is now in your show notes and on our website. And I want to personally thank the people who donated last week. Uh, we were generally touched by your generosity. And thank you so much. You know, we, we put out the show every week and throw it out into the ether. And don't always hear a lot back. We see the downloads and the countries and everybody participating. But for people to, to care about the show, that they actually throw money at us, I mean, thank you. That's uh, That keeps us going, and we really appreciate it. So if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And we'll see you next time, next week. 
Yeah, thank you, everybody, and see you next week.